we're going to try to do actually today is to uh, try to understand design through the spectrum of art and how art actually can uh, have a participation into the DSI ecosystem, which is pretty new. Most of the time, uh, DSI, which stands for Decentralized Science, uh, is an ecosystem full of scientists, laboratories, full of geeks like that, right? <laughs> And the artists and weirdos are not really taking part in this ecosystem, unfortunately. And so what we tried to do with Justine, actually, uh, when we started to speak about this talk and the participation of like mixing design with art, is actually the what kind of role the creatives as part of a society can have into the role of expanding the design ecosystem. And I think it's super interesting, we will see that. I used to uh, call the artists super spreaders um, <coughs> because I really do believe that artists are always at the forefront of the newest ecosystem, newest knowledges and way of thinking about life, science, technology. And so this is why I think it worth to take like the 30, 40 minutes uh, to focus on that and maybe have at the end a conversation with you guys because I'm really interested about how you can see and seize uh, the role of the artist and the creative uh, within the DSI ecosystem. So, just as a forward, because we don't have only DSI people here, we also have creatives and people who might not know a lot about this um, Word. Um, so the DSI actually stands for decentralized science, right? Um, it's it's a trend, an ecosystem uh, that is rooted into the open science uh, ecosystem, and uh, we saw actually the expansion of decentralized science with the boom uh, of the crypto space. But that doesn't mean that uh, DSI is only uh, relying on blockchain technologies, but it is, and we will see how it is actually relying on that, on that technology. So, what I like to say before like, getting into some study cases is that um, I love this quote from Thomas Kuhn. Thomas Kuhn is an epistemologist. And he said that the evolution and implementation of science and technology involve not only cognitive dimension, but also social, economical, and cultural choices in which intervention is possible. Which means that um, we have a big part of our society which is dedicated to science and technology. It impacts us a lot, right? Um, but we are very few, I think, to think about how actually we can have an impact on the way we are developing science and technology in our society through cultural choices. It's super important. Um, we can see today that technologies are at a very high speed, developing at a very high speed, and um, sometimes uh, I have the feeling that our society actually is just like at the end of the chain, like the consumer, right? Uh, they don't have a lot of information and possibilities to talk about this technology, uh, forthcoming technology or forthcoming science. They just discover it as consumers and they are trapped and need to actually use this technology as it is. Uh, we can see this recently with AI. I think uh, here we have someone from Future of Life Institute. They've been trying for years actually to talk about um, the danger of AI, how we should um, do research in AI, and so forth and so on. But I think it's like a minority of people thinking about that. And so it worse, I think, to open the discussion and somehow put the science and the technology in the middle of our agora and our society, which is not the case today. We 
talk about that when it's like a little bit late somehow, right? Um, so maybe we can, uh, as artists and creative, have also an impact on how um, we can impact the implementation of science and technology through ethical discussion, through also artists are always like trying to get involved with uh, scientists, see what they do, why they do that. Um, they are like one of the best people actually to get in touch with early stage scientists also and to see what will be uh, the next paradigm, right? Um, so that's why I think it's really like, it makes sense actually to have this discussion inside this gallery. So, This eye is opening new way to collaborate between the society and the scientists um, for different tools. Um, we mentioned the blockchain. So the blockchain can actually represent several different ways uh, to build this, uh, this relationship between the society and the scientists. Uh, so first of all, um, we have this kind of like decentralized community, the DAOs, right, that we all know. The DAOs, you're going to see, have a very uh, strong role actually into like how we can develop science, how we can acquire also IPs, um, and how we can talk about, um, how we can actually shift also interests uh, into science, because Right now, if I ask you, like, who is actually leading the discussion about science and who is actually, like, deciding what is the most important in scientific research, you might reply that it's actually the industry, because the industry that is uh, working for profit, for their own profit, are going to put, at first, their, their interest, their interest, can be the same than the interest of a society, right? Maybe they gonna cure COVID <coughs> or, or other important diseases. Um, however, sometimes we can see that um, a small portion of the population is suffering from a disease that is not really profitable for those industries. And this is how and where you can see that uh, the DAOs and communities uh, can have a different impact at putting actually up front this and pushing forward discussion about disease and research and science um, in a different way with a different range of interests uh, than uh, the <coughs> industries that are for profit, right? So, this is one way of actually democratizing science and giving the voice to the society about what should we do, what should we consume, for instance, as drugs, right? And so, I think this is, yeah, this is the next slide. Um, some of you might know this uh, endeavor, but um, I think it's a nice study case, actually. Um, our friend from Atina Dao are actually, I would say, okay, Atina Dao is a community, yeah, they, des they define themselves as a community first, right? The centralized uh, community of researcher, uh, founder, and defender working uh, to progress to research and education and also funding for uh, women health. Right, um, so it's super interesting, uh, and it's actually reflecting what I was saying just before. Women health is underevaluated today um, because of many different vectors, actually, uh, because of our society, of our politics, uh, because uh, sometimes uh, because of lack of profit in some diseases that are only touching like a small portion of women, for instance. Um, so actually to push forward women health, one of 
the solution we can find is to go into the path of decentralized science. It's a, I will, um, Athena DAO is a quite recent organization, right? And they, um, they just launched a, their token like, I think, five weeks ago, right? Yeah, how long is September? August, yeah. right. Um, but we can still acquire some, right? Yes, there'll be liquidity pool soon and uh, another sale coming. Okay, thank Stay you. Tuned. <laughs> um, and so, I might be not the best one to talk about that, but it's a good example, I think, about how a community can shed light some, somehow on a disease that is called the endometriosis. That is only touching women, actually, right? It's uh, and so I think endometriosis is like the pain, right? When you are bleeding, when you have your periods, right? Um, we are like we see in our society and in social media um, more and more actually accounts <coughs> talking about women have endometriosis. Some, sometimes some politicians also starting to say that, okay, you might need actually when you have your period to have like one day off from work or something like that. So we can see that the society is progressing. And I think like uh, such endeavor as Athena Dao and, uh, and the community talking about that can actually push forward um, the, the focus on those disease. Community is one thing. Um, but there is also more with Athena DAO, uh, which is uh, a system that is enabled by blockchain, which is called IP NFTs. So what Athena DAO is also doing is to um, have the research through like enabling the DAO to acquire somehow um, an intellectual property, right, from a scientist. And um, so this is what they did recently, I think, yes? Um, so you acquired an IP uh, from, uh, can you, can you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Hi everybody, I'm, I'm with Athena Dow, uh, so this works great. Um, yeah, so we have two IP NFTs that we've, that we've funded so far, uh, both around, an, or, no, sorry, the endometriosis one is actually coming up. So we have funded two around ovarian aging and menopause. Mm -hmm. Endo and PCOS are our second research cohort, so we focus um, specifically on uh, one big focus each time, and the endo PCOS right now we are in the process of kind of expert review, and then they will go to the community to get voted on, and then we will fund them and do the research, and then hopefully have successful IP that will then kind of follow this virtuous circle, provide more funding, proceeds back into the DAO to do more research. Yeah. And change the world. And change the world. <laughs> and change the world. <laughs> and get all the things a little bit better. <laughs> exactly. Um, so this is super interesting. And I think like, I'm part of the DAO. I think it's wonderful actually to, to, to have a DAO that is perfectly fitting into like this kind of spirit of like expanding our knowledge about science and expanding our ability to care about our society through the society, so democratizing science somehow. And so, um, yeah, as we said, uh, this is a little diagram. I'm um, not sure if it seems complicated <coughs> to you or not. But what is interesting to say is that, okay, Athena Dao is a Dao, right? And then you have like the scientific or the trade of research, a scientist, for instance, that is the whole laboratory developing a drug or developing a research to cure something. So the Dao can actually acquire this IP, right? And uh, so the founders or the people from the Dao can actually acquire some tokens, right? So this is how this system works. And um, depending on the DAO, there are like different examples of DAO uh, that are working with IP NFTs and they all have this own, their own governance and they're all like small differences. But what is interesting is that between the industries and the scientific research, you have the DAO, so you have the community. So when I was saying that today we are in a paradigm, without this we are in a paradigm where the society is at the end of the chain 
uh, is just a consumer. Right now, we can see that uh, thanks to this I, the society is actually put in the middle of um, of the system. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I read this paper. So what is that? Can you see what is the purpose of the meeting instead of your system? Yeah, sure. Um, so, this meeting actually said uh, you can be part of a Discord without having the capacity to vote, or maybe like a minor capacity to vote, depending on the DAOs, right? But it's like a, a sort of association, let's say, right? Uh, non profit. Um, it's a sort of association of people with uh, a common goal, a common interest, which like women have, for instance. And, um, and with this particular uh, system, actually, what people can do is that either you can just like follow, participate, help, but maybe you want to also like buy a token or like a small portion of a token or more tokens, right? And, and so you can participate into the vote. So, when the community, so, so the community actually can acquire and help some researchers uh, through the IP NFT. So they can, I, I can go and see and know, oh, okay, you're doing a nice research, our community is very interested, do you already have funding? No, you don't have, okay. Maybe we can fund you somehow. Maybe you can, we can fund your research, right? And so the DAO as a community is actually then able to, um, to decide about this research uh, when you have a big pharma company knocking at your community door is like, hey, we really want this IP because now we, really, we are really interested with endometriosis and we want to release some drugs and blah, blah, blah. You can actually ask your community, should we, should we give them the right to uh, actually use this IP? Uh, should we not? Uh, should we sell this? Da, 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 da. So um, you have like, Somehow the society, and this is not the case today, has a voice and they can say, uh, yeah, they, they can share actually the, uh, what they want about their health. Uh, so somehow you as a community, you have the right on your health uh, more than uh, with the today paradigm actually. So I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so there are many uh, more um, organizations uh, working in the kind of uh, system as uh, Athena DAO is working in. Uh, Valley DAO is actually interesting because uh, it's also a decentralized community uh, funding biotechs. Biotechs are very interesting for us because they have a... So, it's a very large, actually, uh, scientific pillar, so to speak. However, biotech can, uh, just to give you like a, a little interest into biotech, if you are not already interested into biotech, they can give, they can actually like um, create biodegradable um, um, products or materials, yeah, biodegradable materials that can replace plastic, for instance, right? Um, or plastic made out of fuel, right? Why don't we like switch uh, today? Because we have all those monopoles. We have like a sort of like infrastructure. There's a power infrastructure with like, okay, we have a lot of solution today to have a more sustainable way of production, more sustainable materials, thanks to uh, biotech research. But at the same time, we have monopoles. Um, fossil fuel models, for, uh, for instance. So, I bet if you put the society, if you put the community in the middle between uh, the industries and the researcher, you might have more chance, actually, uh, to switch into a more sustainable era than we are today. So, very interesting. And we will see at the end, because here in this gallery, uh, there is a collaboration with another organization called PsyDAO, but we will see that at the end. So we talk about scientists and society, like this, this form of like non-profit organization community. 
What about the artist? So, as I said, the artist is a super spreader. We can see, and we saw this with the NFTs, when everyone started to talk about blockchain, it was mainly because like people were like seeing those crazy images, digital art, buying, collecting, and things like that. So, uh, it's, it's another topic, but uh, why artists are super spreader, we can talk about that later, why it is. And so, that are somehow uh, important component of our society. And so I think, and this is my take for this time, when it comes to talk about a decentralized community um, to change the paradigm of science, it's super important actually to have artists and to give them um, the meaning actually and, and the ways to, to create. Uh, so I'm going to give you like one or two examples, and we have a super spreader here. We're going to have a discussion with you. Okay, um, so just to give you a little example. What a clean desktop. Uh, yeah, yeah, I cleaned it. <laughs> super, super small. Okay, good. Um, it's, uh, so here we have an entire like DSI collection here. Um, the artwork that you can see in this collection are made by artists in partnership with scientists and so they share also the profit of each of the works. Um, just going to go on uh, <coughs> this one. Okay, so this one artwork actually was made between Christine Peterson and uh, and the uh, French artist, actually, uh, T.T.Y. Um, and so, Christine Peterson was talking with him and she said, yeah, you know, in a few years, actually, we're going to be able to revive the dog. <laughs> and the other was like, what, what, why, why, and why is, it, uh, why is it so important for our society, right? And it like leads, actually, to all the questions about longevity. Um, to all the question about like, okay, our society is getting older and older, should we take care also of all the diseases? How can we actually maintain um, wealth and health uh, in our society in the future? Uh, so I'm like, just like uh, passing through a lot of like questioning um, relative to longevity. But what is interesting is that this artist is able to talk about longevity and reviving a dog in a different way than like the disgusting way like most of the people are like, no, what, reviving a dog, this is not ethical, I don't want to hear about that. You should hear about that because you should have an opinion as a society about that and you should be one of the leaders of, uh, you should lead like the, the discussion uh, about this research. So, one of the things he did that is very interesting is that um, I was talking with Christina we were thinking about immortality and this is why you have like this kind of like golden ears here and like this kind of like um, you have very few elements that can uh, make you think about uh, Egyptian society and so what he is revealing through this artwork is that it's not a question that is like very new for us. The immortality was always there. This question was always there. It's like a sort of like societal meme. Um, and so it's very important to talk about that. And you, you shouldn't be ashamed to talk about that as a, peop as a person from a society. And you, you don't need to be a scientist to talk about this question and to grasp this question. So you can like, uh, I don't know, um, good we have a lot of different artworks here. Um, some of them are talking about gene therapy also. Um, a lot of them are talking about biotech, as I said, the like capacity to, for instance, like replace fossil fuel materials uh, with fully biodegradable materials uh, uh, grown in lab, metaphor, right? Um, so, yeah, the, the role of the artists, I think, is to enable a different way to talk about science and have actually like the capacity also to have this conversation with the scientists and then suggest that to 
uh, the rest of the society. So, yeah, now without further ado, Sophia K, please come yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> non, alors, non. <laughs> Elle ne la boit jamais en plus. Merci. Sophia est une digital artist. Tu peux être ici. Sophia est une artiste digitale. Elle est aussi partie de cette collection de digital art. Et oui, j'ai quelques questions sur comment vous. Like, pour vous, qu'est-ce que ça signifie Look at science, look at what scientists are doing. Uh, is it an inspiration or more? Uh, definitely. Um, I really agree with what you were saying about uh, how um, society, <coughs> and, um, science, and uh, technology are not in the same speed of evolution, let's say. Um, and um, we have uh, we had the impression of the artists being like in a, in a bubble of. Just you know, ideas and concepts that really are not related to the world. But there is actually uh, more of that. <laughs> actually, I mean, there's um, artists do understand like um, even complex concepts of science, and I think that they even imagine that uh, can like visualize it. And sometimes uh, um, I really think that uh, science and our ways of uh, watching uh, into like microscope data. They're of course involving the technology, but uh, they don't have the whole concept. If not, if they would, all science would be like the same type of, uh, you know, yeah. like the physics, mathematics, or bi bioscience. They don't have the, they have the same rules. This is why, because they don't have the same tools for observation of what is behind it. So at the at the end, I do think that artists and scientists do have to be like collaborating because uh, they do both communicate ideas and. Uh, Evolve and develop, and they do communicate this to people that really are aware of science and neither the simulation and visualizers are a lot close to science, actually. Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, do you think you, you, you share a common language and you have like two different languages? How would you describe this? Uh, I think that um, okay, we don't do have the same. Um, Vocabulary, but we have like maybe uh, um, some visions. We understand some visions, some scientific visions, and we can uh, even we can like um, visualize them, develop them, even, even propose uh, solutions that wouldn't be like very obvious. Uh, just really rhythm, scientific methodologies. I mean, we do have we are we are inspired by scientific methodologies, but we also propose those things that are not in the agenda, let's say, but it makes uh, it. Yeah, and you demonstrate also the fact that actually, like, you don't need to have a PhD in uh, quantum physics uh, to try to catch something. Actually, like, there is a sensibility or an aesthetic actually to understand science, yeah, right? Of course, and um, even I mean, they do have uh, some prototype. You know, the project with the proteins we had. Um, I mean, they did come with like a. And show them the, I mean, they want the local kind of visualization. There's like a, a, a scientific visualization, and you know, that you just, like, you just spice it a bit up, and you know, like it's kind of inspired of the scientific concept to create like, something very more, more artistic to communicate and, and an idea about proteins and DNA so just visually. So, I think it was for me, it was fun to work with this subject. And, yeah, I think it's. it's <laughs> this is this is the the outlook of the, the proteins, yeah. right? Because it's like yeah, it's like people like press themselves to the DNA in order to become. Uh, uh, this is how actually um, I, I remember when I was like I'm just, I'm just uh, imagining stuff. Um, the virus works, and so this is also how the way to cure viruses by proteins because viruses are sometimes yeah. bad proteins. I mean, so like that. <laughs> and you can modify also them, and then this is like this kind of plasticity that you are like experimenting also um, either by doing a side by being a scientist or an artist, right? So you have also this plasticity that there is that there is at stake, 
uh, in both works. So yeah, it's pretty magical actually. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Really. <laughs> and so to finish, um, I wanted to uh, invite you to look at some of the artworks here um, that uh, were made in uh, collaboration with Side Out. Um, so as you know, uh, this uh, this entire exhibition is dedicated to psychedelics and uh, our like mind plasticity actually and uh, some of them I think are also touching uh, the subject of like why should shouldn't we actually use in psychedelics why is it so bad and forbidden in our society why should we always use um, pharmaceutical drugs that can have actually pretty much the same effects or maybe even like less effects uh, than uh, some of the drugs. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, you can talk with our professional curator here about psychedelics and, uh, and uh, Justine was leading actually this collaboration with Psydaosh, so she know more about that, but like all the screens that you can see here um, are artworks made in collaboration with Psydaosh, so if the collector acquired this artwork, uh, part of uh, the proceeds are actually are funding the psychedelic research. So, yeah, thank you so much. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah.